Welcome to the Wide World of Esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Noor. Today, my guest is Elliot Oreskovic, Executive Co-Director of United States Esports Association. Our topic is U.S. Esports Association, Pioneering Esports Development in the U.S. So, Elliot, it's great to have you here. No, it's great to be on. All right. So uh, it was wonderful meeting you at um, Esports Next in Chicago. And I actually wasn't aware of your association. So tell us about it. Yeah. Um, so uh, as we all now know, the United States Esports Association um, founded in 2018, uh, but things really started kicking off in 2020. Um, originally, the organization was founded to do like AAU style uh amateur development since you know 2018 that was not a thing i mean it still isn't really a thing now if we're being honest um though there are you know local examples that do exist um around 2021 2022 we started to move away from that uh and then now we're just focused on charitable stuff you know that no one else really wants to do which i'm sure we'll talk about all right fantastic so how would you describe the association's role and influence in esports uh yeah i mean so this gets into the like programmatic stuff right now um so right now our two main like priority areas are uh ecological sustainability uh, and then national security more broadly though climate change is now a national security concern um on the ecological sustainability side uh, we are involved in the Sports for Climate Action Framework, uh, and we're the only, I think we're still the only, esports organization uh, on the Race to Zero. Both of those are uh, coordinated by the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, Secretariat, so just the people that do climate change stuff uh, at the UN level. Um, within the U.S., sort of the focus there is on getting, first, getting people to start uh, contributing towards national estimates of esports, uh, what's called scope two emissions. So, like, how much energy are you using? And then, because of that, what is the uh, cost to the, in this case, to the climate um, through primarily carbon dioxide, since it's a little harder to do all the other gases. Um, but, you know, estimates are estimates. So, it's just a matter of, you know, having a formula to do it. And getting hours uh and then on the national security side sort of the focus is on starting the question or starting the conversation uh, and then asking the questions that need to be asked um the united states has not played you know as significant of a role in global esports development as you know you probably would have predicted 20 30 years ago just from where we were at in general uh and then also within like the game development space and just because it's a big economy You'd imagine that we'd have some sort of sizable influence. Um, again, that's not been the case. And then uh, as the economy has struggled uh, after the pandemic, even during the pandemic, um, even domestic development is kind of difficult. And because of that, then we have to balance the two issues of um, first, how are we going to stack up globally? And then more importantly, how are we going to do things at home? So those two things. You know, right. but again, you know, it's programmatic for the one conversation starting for the other. You know, it's sort of, you know, going back to the climate change issue and efforts to be carbon neutral. You know, it's kind of interesting to me on the one hand that esports is electronic, meaning that you're using electricity, you're using a lot of energy, like in order to have events in order to just play you have to have energy internet so it's it seems to me that there is an impact on the other hand esports is by nature it can be done remotely so there are this there's arguably less travel than there would be for other sports um how does all that weigh out and how do you approach this issue um in light of those um yeah I, I mean honestly so that makes it even more difficult um because when when they're having the conversation and they i mean the group of people you know globally that are doing this um 
when you're having this kind of a conversation with the traditional sports federations um, and then like the private companies that actually do all of the, the real work, it's a lot easier to say, OK, we have four events per year. Those events are the only time uh, that we are really responsible for sizable emissions. Therefore, we focus all of our efforts on, you know, like sustainable procurement uh, or dealing with fan travel and making sure that that's not going to be too much of an issue, uh, diverting fans away if that's going to be a, you know, a problem. Um, because esports doesn't need that uh, in order to function reasonably well, obviously it's not perfect. Um, I would I would even argue at times it's not good um, because it doesn't require that we now have to deal with the reality of, OK, well, there isn't really a uh, template for what you do with an industry that works that way, except for tech. But it's not really tech. Uh, obviously, it intersects, but there are still sports influences. Um, and it, it turns out dealing with just uh, scope to emissions within an industry where we don't have uh, any meaningful coordination. Um, collaboration is, if it exists, it's not very mature um, and it needs to become that. Uh, but if it doesn't exist, which is the case for the the ga larger game developers and IP holders, you know, it, it makes it very difficult to persuade tournament organizers who are doing the in-person events, the limited ones, um, that this is something they should focus on. And then the final step to that is even when we have, you know, those esports events uh, that are in person in the U.S., obviously the bigger ones, those are still held like at traditional stadiums. Um, we don't have, you know, the kind of infrastructure to support uh, large scale esports or dedicated esports venues uh, across the country, at, at least like we can for traditional sports. So if the traditional sports industry isn't going to do their part, for the in, in person and the venue stuff, which they don't do, progress is made, but it's not you know enough. Um, we run into that barrier, plus obviously the the scope two stuff. But it all just comes down to the fact that it's decentralized and there isn't a lot of cl uh, collaboration and coordination, which makes all of this you know estimates. And it's just a matter of how good is the estimate going to be, and how much hand waving are we going to have to do to um, guess how uh, significant the United States contributions are. Sure. And moving on to another question, and this is something that I, has been a big deal in the esports um, arena for quite a while, and that is what ways does your association support or regulate competition within esports? Yeah, so we, so from very early on, uh, because of the name, and uh, we used to be involved in the Global Esports Federation uh, for two years. So as we were going out and having conversations with people uh, in the amateur community, which is where we all kind of came from, uh, collegiate as well, there was always the issue um, of not wanting to be seen uh, as a governing body, quote unquote, because at the time, and this was 2020, 2021, that was still a you know a bad word in the U.S. Um, for whatever reason. Now I think people are starting to get over that, uh, and there are a lot of colleges that are more than happy, you know, to collaborate and to send their players to GEF and IESF events. Um, but again, at the time, that was an issue for us. So we made the 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 conscious decision just so that we had something that was strategically viable um, long term for us. Uh, to move away from that as a dedicated, like programmatic fo uh, focus. So now all the competition stuff that we do is with uh, primarily the Amateur Esports Association, which is another 501c3 uh, in the US. They do um, basically AAU stuff. So what the USCA was originally founded to do, they've done it uh, and they do it successfully. So they have between it, the estimate you know, it varies by the time of year, but it's like between 40 and 60 um, in-person venues that they work with. Uh, some are independent, some are franchised. And through them, they they make all of the competition happen. So with the relationship that we have with that organization, um, you know, well, one, 
we're able to start doing uh, in, in a meaningful way the uh, ecological sustainability programming. And because they have a sizable chunk of a specific demographic, and of course, the, the in-person part, we're able to make that happen. And then long-term, move towards uh, voluntarily getting people to start to standardize things. Um, and then that obviously is going to have competition consequences. Um, if we're going to say, hey, you need to like tone down how long these computers are on all day, uh, especially if they're not being used, et cetera. Um, we are still like, again, we don't want to be seen you know, sort of as a sanctioning body or a governing body, because that doesn't really need to be needed. Um, so over time, the goal is to, you know, soft introduce that sort of thing with a with a very cooperative and collaborative and voluntary, ultimately, uh, focus. So that's kind of where we are, we are with that. It is still a core part of what the long term version of the USCA needs to be. But, you know, time exists, unfortunately. So my background is with USA Triathlon. So I have a lot of experience in different roles in a national governing body of sport. So one of the roles of that traditional sport governing body is to address issues of doping. And I know computer doping um, and, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's different, different ways that people can cheat in esports. Are you doing anything to address those kind of issues? So the level of competition like that we're tangential to isn't where doping would be like addressed normally. So we're talking, I don't know, nine, maybe not nine, I think 12 to 13 and then 15. It's like 12 to 15 year olds is what the mm. AA tends to work with. Yeah. Um, and then we do have a relationship with the NECC, uh, and that that's college. Um, so, and and they already all follow NCAA or NAA rules, uh, mm -hmm. just because they have to. I uh, I don't even think that'd be something we'd try to touch because none of us are competent in doing that. Um, I'm aware it's a thing that should probably be addressed long term, but you know, especially trying to do it within an esports context, it's like, okay, well, what? What are we really targeting here and why? And and is this like an adequate use of resources? And should this be the focus or should we be focusing on other forms of cheating uh, that, you know, are more prevalent? And then betting's influence, I would say, would be another sure. area. But that's, you know, I'm not the person for that. And and I'm sure that when those things come to light as being problems, then those things would be potentially addressed but until they are problems that you're seeing that are being raised and brought to your attention then maybe it isn't so important but do you think that um u.s esports association will ultimately be part of the u.s olympic committee like traditional um sports governing bodies are so we actually uh, and, and this goes back to when we were in the GEF. Um, as we were leaving, we were sort of uh, maturing and revisiting our, our bylaws. And we, in order to have a hard statement that we are not trying to do, you know, the the uh, governing role, we actually baked it into our uh, governing documents that we're not supposed to be even asking, you know, for that kind of uh, participation or recognition. Um, so unless there was a governance level, like change, uh, in, in perception about what the USDA should be doing and what the role is, I'd say no. Um, and this, uh, you know, coincides just with a larger focus of moving away from competition per se to doing the charitable stuff surrounding it. Um, obviously in the context of the USOPC, those overlap, but where we are right now with esports, they, they don't, unfortunately. So we we chose to focus on the one, and then with partners do the uh, do the other. So, what is your background that led you to be in this position? Yeah. Um, so I graduated with a BBA in marketing. 
uh, from Cleveland State. I'm in Cleveland, so I just went to the local university. Um, I graduated with a BBA in uh, 2020, uh, and I just graduated with an MBA. Somewhere along the line, uh, I did a year of master's level econ uh, for whatever reason. Um, I got halfway through it. I did all of the hard math, and then I was like, yeah, I don't want to do that ever again. Uh, and, you know, the the university was paying for it. So I just said, whatever, you know, we'll do something else. Um, moving out of my undergrad, I, you know, was was looking for something to do um, that would eventually transition into a career. Uh, at that time, I was just doing student employment uh, with specifically working at the writing center. So, you know, undergrad all the way through professor level writing. Um, I was very good at it, but that's not a sustainable career. Uh, unfortunately, it should be. It'd be cool if it were. Uh, I came across the USCA uh, just because I was looking for an organization that was in esports um, and it was doing something interesting. Not not initially uh, as a as a career avenue, uh, but as a side thing that I was doing with a with a buddy, uh, we were actually organizing competitions in the local or in not in the local, but uh, in, at the amateur level uh, for Rainbow Six Siege. And we were always looking to have a more holistic version of competition. Um, and we tried to talk to the IESF at the time, and that wasn't a conversation that was being had. Uh, so the the USCF had, or the, uh, not the USCF, the USCA uh, had good enough SEO at the time that it came up in a Google search. I saw that they were taking interns. I was like, all right, I'll do this for a summer uh, and then go do something more interesting. And then it turns out that what was more interesting was just running it uh, long term. So got into it completely by accident. Uh, I, I didn't even get into esports, you know, intentionally. Uh, a buddy called me up one day. He was doing an entrepreneurship competition uh, for his college. And he's like, hey, I need you to just make up some finance uh, finances. I'm like, OK, sure. Like, that's easy enough to do. Uh, and what it was for uh, was for a local esports lounge. Um, that that was 2018. So things just kind of snowballed accidentally. And then now, you know, I'm here advocating for things. Right. And then you started um, your organization was formed fairly close before the um, pandemic. And so how did the um, COVID-19 pandemic impact your organization? Um. I mean, I'm not, I'm still not entirely sure. I'm uh, the, everything that we did to grow it initially was done during the pandemic. And then as we were coming out of the pandemic, that's really when like we started to have the specific focus we do now. So it was a lot of trial and error. Luckily we had the, op we, I mean, we had the opportunity to, to do things that weren't going to work long-term. Um, and because of that, now we have something that I'm at least comfortable, uh, putting time and effort into and I think the rest of the organization agrees um I I think one of the other things that did help if anything from uh growing the organization during the pandemic was that that was also when a lot of other organizations were doing the same thing uh and being on the nonprofit side of it that was and remains a small subset uh, of people who are doing uh esports across the country so you know, there's a lot of people you just know because uh, they were very accessible, you know, two, three, four years ago. And then now it's a little more intimidating, I would imagine, uh, to try to reach out. But at the time it was like, yeah, just email them or, or Discord, you know, talk on Discord because that's what everyone's doing. You know, and as the industry professionalizes, I'm sure that won't remain a thing. Um, but I think that was probably the most profound impact. And luckily it was positive. Sure. So is the USCA doing anything um, regarding diversity and inclusion? So it's fantastic you you bring that up. Um, we, way back when, we did try to do uh, DEI, um, uh, specific DEI programming. But again, that was when we were totally uh, competition focused. So now that we're not doing that, that was not in the initial sort of rollout of things. 
uh moving it towards the end of this year we want to get we we want to bring on in uh, at least one intern paid luckily we have the opportunity to do that now which i'm happy with um to start doing a <laughs> i can't say the name because we haven't started publishing it yet uh but but basically to do dei stuff uh focusing on the lgbtq community uh within esports obviously there are organizations that do it uh you know like that that's what the organization does um but mixing it with the other work that we do again with the partners that we have uh is kind of the focus so tldr yes we just haven't announced it so unfortunately i don't have specifics and i I don't want to give away our our marketing so you noted that you're a nonprofit. um are there um entities that are members of of your your association or um how do you raise money to operate that's a wonderful question uh we do not have members um that was also one of the big shifts originally there we did have a membership component um and then i think probably close to 100 percent of our funding right now is through a grant uh with the u.s department of homeland security uh under their targeted violence and terrorism prevention program which for that we are developing and then implementing a national uh, esports honor society in partnership with the NECC, the National Esports Collegiate Conference. Um, so upskilling colleges to have more holistic programming, specifically targeting uh, media and information literacy, uh, professional development, community and civic engagement, uh, and then peer and intergenerational mentoring. So you don't have to, you know, as a college who probably got into esports because you saw it as a way to make money. Um, whether directly or indirectly, uh, you don't have to be worrying about how you're going to offer like a like a sustainable holistic program long term. That is kind of uh, what the point of that program is. And luckily, the DHS agreed that that was a thing that would advance their uh, grant goals. So I previously mentioned my experience with USA Triathlon, and one of the ways that they operate is that um uh if if a race wants to be um a USAT certified race they essentially what they get out of it by paying the fee is they get insurance and so it's kind of i almost call it an insurance program have you ever thought of doing something where you're providing uh the benefit of insurance to events um through um certification uh i mean that's a not the insurance part specifically but we have i mean right now we're talking with the aea about what that would look like you know to roll out as a larger hey let's bring everyone together kind of program um especially since they've done it successfully with uh dedicated in-person venues um it's not something I think we would do right now. And then again, for like the insurance part, we're not competent in doing that. So we would need to find people, you know, who one that we trust and then two are, are competent to do it. Um, I think that just kind of depends on a lot of other factors that we're not even like concerned with primarily. Um, so I'd say if it comes up as an opportunity that we can like meaningfully contribute to, cool. Um, but I don't think it would be something that we would pump a lot of time and effort into. Um, yeah, mainly again, cause that's well beyond what anybody in the organization, uh, is competent doing. You know, I think if there are losses or issues that make insurance a bigger deal for, for the sport, I think that that could occur like cyber attacks, um, could ultimately mean that there's a need for um, cyber insurance and that, you know, and who would provide that and would an association provide it? Those kind of things I could see would, you know, might trigger that, but I, you know, I can see where, where that isn't a thing right now. So what do you see? Yeah. The oh, go ahead. Well, well, so, I mean, it is also like an interesting, totally unrelated and I'm not a financial person, but, it is an interesting question of what esports insurance would even mean um or what what that would be you know what what would meaningfully 
actually do something in this context that's like comprehensive enough to entice uh, organizations to want to participate to then benefit from. Um, you know, with, with within the traditional sports context, I think it's a little more clear, um, mm -hmm. which is why it exists and because right. it is like a real everyday concern. But within esports, it's like, what are you going to do? Combine five, six, seven different packages together uh, and then somehow try to sell that like at an affordable rate. Again, I'm not an insurance person, so I don't know. Uh, but I would imagine um, just from having to deal with insurance uh, personally and then, you know, for organizations that that's already complex enough um, on its own. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are people who know insurance that would have a, a better answer, but it's not something that I see the the finance industry or the finance sector touching. And, you know, esports organizations, I mean, most, I don't think, are specifically calling for it. Do you need insurance? In my amateur opinion, 100% insurance is probably a good thing. Uh, is it affordable for most people? Absolutely not, uh, which, which would be another, you know, barrier. Which to the to the earlier point, you know, having an organizational membership benefit where you're not paying the entire actual cost of it would be beneficial. But all of those other issues that we're not competent to answer and I'm not also competent to answer kind of make that a, a large open question. But it is interesting. So, so how can um, viewers find your organization? What's your uh, tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so we do like all of our stuff uh, is on the website. So esportsus.org. Um, the Twitter is also relatively active uh, at official underscore USEA. I, I'd say the website is the most comprehensive version of public facing stuff. Thank you, Elliot. I really appreciate it. Um, great job today. Yeah. No, it's been great to talk to you, with you. All right, so thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Uh, join us in two weeks. My guests will be uh, Noel, Chrisio Naylor, Jennifer um, Ahrens, and Peter Dubrow of Stockton University. See you then.